Welcome to another of our NWBA Midweek Reflections that I hope will make some contribution to your journey of discipleship through what is a pretty tough and demanding experience for us all at the moment. And that's where I want to begin this week, just by perhaps encouraging you to recognise something of the reality that you're facing right now. You know, I know that compared to some of the struggles and sufferings that are going on in our world, some of the eras of struggle and persecution that have taken place in history, or indeed some of the conflicts in which people have been caught up, perhaps this 21st century lockdown can seem a bit trivial in comparison, but there's a difference. This is something that you are experiencing right now. It may not be the worst thing that you've ever experienced and compared to the suffering of some, what you're going through might not be on the same scale, but it is what you are going through and it will be taking its toll on you. It's taking its toll on all of us. Sure, some of us might manage to sit in front of a webcam and share some words of encouragement from time to time, but it doesn't mean that at other times we're not also having our own struggles. And I want to invite you to acknowledge that because the excerpt from the Bible that I want to share with you in this video could be described as one almighty groan, or at least explaining to us why we might want to let out an almighty groan. And, and perhaps more to the point, letting us know that one almighty groan can sometimes be a perfectly appropriate, completely spiritual, and dare I say, even theologically informed reaction to the world around us. So let's hear those words from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 8 and verses 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage and decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who are, have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The whole of creation is groaning. That's some statement. And perhaps you can see, therefore, why I was drawn to it. Of course, I think we have to be honest with ourselves here. It's very easy to see a worldwide pandemic as creation groaning. There's a biological and physical groaning as this disordered virus ruthlessly makes its way through the human population. There's the groaning of suffering as those who are afflicted fight to overcome it. There's the groaning of mourning from the loved ones of those who've lost that fight. There's the groaning of fear as we each recognise our own vulnerability and there is the groaning of despair at the way in which some seem to disregard the well-being of others either through abusing and ignoring the current regulations or through other acts of violence and discrimination that have sadly risen to the fore in recent days. But we still have to recognise the creation has actually been groaning for quite a while. The groaning of a scorched earth, the groaning of climate change, the groaning of air pollution. And maybe we have to be humble and honest and say that the real issue right now is that we've just started taking notice of that groaning because we've been impacted by it. But it is not my intent to try and layer you up with guilt here because I'm sure that much of what I've just said you've already worked out for yourself but what I do want to do is explore how we deal with that inner unease that might give us cause to groan inwardly or, or perhaps even groan outwardly. And what I find intriguing and encouraging in these words from the New Testament book of Romans is that they offer us something of a paradox, at least on the surface. 
because these are words of hope. They speak of a glory that will be revealed, a creation that is waiting in eager expectation, a harvest of hope of which we will be the first fruits, a glorious inheritance and a physical redemption. Yet they speak of a refrain of groaning in the midst of all of that. And I want to invite you to recognise that paradox for a moment, because it strikes me that if you are going through the mill, so to speak, if you're struggling and all you feel like doing is groaning, then there are two things that really are not a lot of help to you. The first is somehow feeling that you're not allowed to give your true emotions their full expression. You know, being told to cheer up and put a brave face on things when we're really struggling might help the people who've asked us to do it because they then don't have to notice that we're struggling. But it does very little for our own well-being. In fact, if anything, it's likely to make us feel worse. And the other thing that we can often struggle with is, is somehow not being able to understand things. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you're travelling through roadworks or caught on it in a delay on the motorway, you'll very often find that there are signs explaining to you what's going on, why you're in the situation that you're in. And this is apparently because psychologists have worked out that we are less prone to get anxious and stressed if we know what's happening than we are if we don't. And anxiety and stress can lead to road rage, which can lead to accidents. So simply telling us why is good for everyone. It's good for our well-being. In other words, they need us to wait patiently and they know that we will find that easier if we know why it is that we're waiting. And of course, that same invitation can be found at the heart of these verses from Romans, verse 25. We wait for what we do not yet have, it says. We wait patiently. So I'd suggest that these few verses from Romans don't just wag a finger at us and tell us to be patient. They equip us to be patient. Firstly, by giving us permission to release our frustrations. And secondly, by explaining why we have permission to groan. You know, it's interesting that the role creation plays is part of the worship and the praise of God. You don't have to look for very long through, say, the book of Psalms before you come across a phrase like the heavens declare the glory of the Lord or let every creature praise his holy name or let the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing for joy. So God's word can speak of a creation that can both praise God and yet also be groaning. And what you can also notice is that these few verses from Romans manage to pretty much sweep the whole of human history. Verse 20 speaks of a reality that we can trace right back to the book of Genesis. It speaks of creation being subdued, held in bondage to decay by something that we often theologically today call the fall. And it also speaks of a day when God's children, as the writer puts it here, will be revealed. In other words, he is looking from the very beginning of time into his present experience and then on to the end of time. And describing creation as groaning all the way through it as it awaits its liberation. The same creation that declares the glory of God and echoes with the praises of God. And we're part of that creation, as well as being part of, of God's new creation. We live in anticipation of God's redemption. We live in hope, a hope in which we are securely saved, according to Paul's words here. But we also live as part of that groaning, bonded creation, a creation which can be inflicted by disease and pandemics and fear and frustration. And so we could go on. And the point that I want to make here is that God doesn't invite us to simply put a brave face on it or somehow imagine that if things are tough, then the narratives of hope have, have, have abandoned us. In fact, it seems to me that Paul is actually saying the opposite. Creation is groaning because it knows something better is coming. A glory which, when revealed, will show our present struggles and sufferings to be in just no comparison. Creation is groaning, he says, as though in childbirth, which, which means first, as any mother will tell you, it's not groaning without good cause, but it's groaning in, in anticipation of something better. 
and the pain that gives cause to the groaning is in and of itself a sign of that something wonderful that is coming, new birth, new life. So yes, we are groaning with creation. We're groaning because we're caught up in a creation being ravaged by disease and we are having to live as less than what we know we could be because of the impact of that. But what we're experiencing, according to these verses from Romans, is the latest episode in an entire human history where the song of creation, yes, can be a glorious and beautiful song of praise to God, but also one of groaning as it remains trapped and less than it could be. And we have as yet only caught glimpses of that glorious new heavenly reality of which we are, yes, fully a part, even though for now we remain bound by the struggles of our own belonging to creation. And so I want to invite you to spend some time with these words from the book of Romans. As ever, I would encourage you to find them in the Bible or you can always look them up on a computer or a smartphone and find some space in your day when you know that you can properly meditate on them. And here's some things that you might want to reflect on. First, it's natural to groan. You're part of a groaning creation and the brokenness of that creation is truly impacting us at the moment. So spend some time recognising that impact. Recognising what current events mean for you. Bring these to the very centre of your prayer and your reflection. God expects you to groan. So don't feel that you somehow have to put on your best face to God. Just tell God how it is and spend some time getting in touch with yourself. How are you coping physically? How are you coping emotionally? How is this affecting your friends and your relationship? What else is causing you dismay and despair? Just bring those things to God. And then recognise that part of your current frustration is because you can see a better future. We have received the first fruits of that new inheritance. But as the writer of Romans says, hope is only hope because it contains that which is yet unseen. So try to recognise that even your sense of despair is a sign of a greater hope. And then thirdly, recognise the scale of that hope. Our present sufferings don't just compare with the glory that will be revealed. They, they just don't come into the same league. And notice again that God's word doesn't diminish our struggles. It doesn't say, cheer up, it's not that bad. It says, release your inner groans in the confidence that a better day is coming. And notice too, that it speaks of being adopted as sons. Now, this is one of those places in the Bible where I don't think that we should just automatically shift and use inclusive language because these words were written in a culture where only sons inherited. So for Paul to write to a Christian community of women and men describing them as sons, it doesn't exclude the women, it includes them. Everyone is an heir, says Paul. Everyone has this inheritance, an inheritance of liberation and freedom of glory. So spend some time just reflecting and re-owning that inheritance. And that could then just lead you on to considering what else you have to give God thanks for. Not as a denial of those things that make you grow, but recognising that the two belong together. It's the same creation that the psalm writer speaks of praising God, that this letter writer describes as groaning. So being thankful to God is not a matter of drowning out your groaning or trying to pretend that nothing's bothering you, but recognising that you can praise and worship God even when something is bothering you. And then finally, let those words wait patiently, still your soul. And again, let me highlight that this is said not as a kind of imposed expectation, but more as of a consequence of recognising some of those things that I've highlighted already above. And you know, one of the things that causes me the most impatience when I'm waiting for something is the fear that it might not come to fruition. But Romans reminds us that our inheritance is secure. It's certain. 
We haven't fully seen it, otherwise we'd have no cause for hope. But our groanings are a sign of a longing for something better. And our longing for something better comes from our knowledge that something better is coming. So take this invitation to heart. The verses go on to speak of how the Holy Spirit helps us in our groanings, as one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. So simply invite God to grant you the patience and stillness that you need right now. And then, as ever, if you can, try to encourage a friend or a prayer partner to do the same. And then get in touch with each other. Share what these verses have said to you. Pray for each other and pray together for the world and, and if your prayers include a few groans then I think that's okay. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.